Hello and welcome. I'm Anna, and this is a new episode of Proyecto Co, a channel that explores ideas, methods, and mental models that will help you expand your knowledge around social innovation, develop your potential, and master the best of what experts and entrepreneurs have already learned. Today we talk to Maria Zubeldia, head of the Entrepreneurship Center at Said Business School at Oxford University. We explore the role of academia in supporting and training entrepreneurs, and in doing so, Maria shares the best practices that allowed them to rapidly innovate in times of the COVID-19. We also talk about the importance of developing a solid and diverse ecosystem, the key factors that entrepreneurs should consider throughout the current crisis, and much more. Maria, it's a great pleasure to have you on Proyecto Co. Thank you, Anna. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with, with you. In your position, you're in constant contact to entrepreneurs. And I'm very interested in knowing your opinion about the role of academia in supporting and triggering entrepreneurship. Huh. That's, that's a, a great question. For me, the role of academia is, is key. Actually, in the last sort of 20 years, the attention of universities towards the creation of new ventures or spin-offs, and more generally about entrepreneurship, has increased a lot. Well, it's called the third mission, as we, all, as we have the objective of contributing to local economic development. But why, why academic uh, entrepreneurship has emerged? Well, uh, I mean, there are, there's a plenty of research and literature that has distinguished like main, main, the following main aspects. Personal factors, maybe such as faculty motivations, also financial uh, factors, such as the amount of money that universities invest in research activities. Also, of course, organizational factors, such as the size and other characteristics, such as the technology transfer offices, and other cultural factors, like the internal culture of the university itself, and the policy and the ecosystem factors. And here is where the Entrepreneurship Center plays, plays a key role. However, uh, I think in the past, everyone has been talking about spin-offs, uh, but entrepreneurship uh, education hasn't been mentioned uh, that much. And for me, is uh, one of the key pillars on developing an entrepreneurial culture within society in general. Mm -hmm. I think entrepreneurship education raises the entrepreneurial attitudes and intentions of students. It also favors the development of entrepreneurial competences and skills, which in turn may favor the creation of new ventures. In fact, a, a positive entrepreneurial a culture bringing relevant examples achieved by other entrepreneurs or even a pioneering professors or students uh, on even alumni, we have a lot of alumni for instance, is key to mm -hmm. trigger the entrepreneurial appetite of students. And it motivates other professors and students to do the same, just following the example. Mm -hmm. So it's about creating an entrepreneurial culture. Um, could you give us some hints on how you do it? Yes, definitely it is. And, you know, um, and the way, the way we do it uh, at the University of Oxford, uh, that will kind of help you to sort of understand uh, what, what do we do about it, is like, you know, Oxford has uh, the most vibrant ecosystem in the UK, in Europe, and probably in the US. And it's getting better and better very quickly. Uh, the good thing is there's not a clear pathway that all entrepreneurs need to follow. And instead, there is a powerful ecosystem with many different stakeholders involved in supporting entrepreneurship that actually are complementary and we work closely together. It's a bit of a chaos in a positive way. So chaos for me is great to foster innovation. Um, so we don't want to, uh, to have too much structure uh, around it. Um, and our students and entrepreneurs at Said Business School just find it fascinating to navigate across this ecosystem. So, so the way uh, the Entrepreneurship Center, I mean, we play a key role for this. And the way we like to look at it is like a, a, a pyramid where you have at, at, the, at the very bottom of the pyramid, you have more kind of general uh, mindset and culture uh, training uh, activities. And uh, a bit farther up, you move into sort of a skill set and competences. Of course, you go up and you go into methodologies and frameworks. And then at the top of the pyramid, you have more accelerators, mentors, networks, and seed funding in the end. So 
basically you have more indirectly related to venture creation parameters at the bottom of the pyramid and more um, directly related with the impact of the, of the venture creation at the top of the pyramid. And for this, the, at the Entrepreneurship Center, we cover a broad range of services and programs across all the pyramid. And we used to, uh, we, we didn't have an accelerator, for instance, but we recently at Said we launched CDL, the Creative Destruction Lab program, which is highly, is like, a, is like, is not an accelerator itself, it's a mentoring program, but very, very um, uh, trying to support those startups that are tackling uh, a specific uh, problem and that are more advanced than uh, an, early, an, an early stage. You interact and collaborate with many different stakeholders. Could you give us some examples of the segments of stakeholders that you collaborate with? Well, yes. So we have, I mean, the university in this ecosystem has an amazing uh, traction, yeah, in that sense. So within the university we have, so, so for instance, the technology transfer unit of the university, Oxford University Innovation, is where they, they deal with all the research and all the patents that come from the university. So we, we run a few programs in collaboration with them. Uh, also, we collaborate with, the, with OSI, which is the, a big fund that actually invests in, this, in these companies. So we, we closely collaborate with them. Within the side business school, there are other initiatives such as SCOL, that is focused only on social entrepreneurship. So we work very closely with them. And we also recently launched CDL, uh, the program, the Creative Destruction Lab that I've just mentioned. And we, we work very closely with them uh, too. And, uh, but also we have uh, the, the Foundry, which is uh, more open to the wider student community at the university and less focus on, on the business school students. So we, between all of us, we, we do a lot of activities and programs uh, together and, and students navigate uh, across all these different uh, institutions. Fantastic. Yeah. So um, is, are you also collaborating, for instance, with the public sector? Yes, uh, we do. And um, it's funny because we have a program that we run on innovation to support uh, SMEs on innovation and is actually led by the Oxford City Council, yeah, and by, by Oxlab, which is one of the of the development sort of um, agents within the region. And we, we work uh, closely with them and with other kind of uh, stakeholders across the health sector, some uh, business incubators across the region. So yes, definitely, yes. Fantastic. So you're also an expert in, in innovation and in knowledge sharing. And I was wondering, how did you launch one of the initiatives and, and which were the, the challenges that you faced and how did you tackle them in order to be innovative, no? Yeah, well, that's, that's a great question. And yes, I mean, innovation is my background and is my passion too. So we, we were faced um, currently, I mean, recently, a couple of months ago, we were faced with this, like all of a sudden we, we were working from home. All our programming remained because we were doing everything online. So still our workload didn't, didn't sort of uh, decrease dramatically or anything <laughs> at all. But then we saw our students, which is like, you know, we are a center that we provide all services uh, for our students. And we saw them, they were, you know, sent back home uh, from all different countries across the world. With, uh, with more time because, you know, they don't go out and, and funnily enough, they have <laughs> less social life and more time. And some of them, of course, they were like just sitting down in front of a computer, like most of us are. And, and they were struggling because they were, well, on the one hand, they wanted to do something relevant, but also they didn't know what to do. So we, we just thought, okay, we need to do something. So we need to do something about this and we need to try to enhance the student experience during their program and bring them some relevant experience that they can actually, once they, the, this crisis finishes, they can look backwards and say, well, I'm proud because during the crisis, this is what I did. And at the same time, they can build their skill set and their CV and have some relevant um, background and experience that can help them in the, in the, in the near future. Because of course, the, you know, the, the, the industry and the recruitment side of things is gonna, is gonna get worse. So, so we used, I mean, I, I, um, I use a, a methodology that, an innovation that, I, that I've used in the past um, 
and we is based on design thinking and we just thought okay let's let's start by really understanding what are the problems and the needs that we want to solve and we took a, many interviews to those students but also to some SMEs, startups and scale-ups across the around the ecosystem to ask them what do you need now what are you know your your biggest challenges that you are facing just to see and navigate how we could help them with those. So we started with this kind of um, need-led uh, approach of understanding their needs. And it, this was very, very interesting because we saw that at, at the beginning, we thought, well, they are gonna need funding. So there's nothing really we can do. But we, we surprisingly found that there are many other things that they needed that we could help them with. So we put together a program, a four-month program called LIBER, uh, to reinvent yourself and uh, freedom is the Latin word for, for freedom uh, for free. And, and we've actually launched it a, a couple of weeks ago and we've had a really good response, a very positive response, both from the student community and also from uh, uh, startups, uh, SMEs or scale-ups across, you know, the, the, uh, across the UK. And the idea behind the program is to have, create some business units made of students, uh, both sort of MBAs plus uh, executive MBAs from the business school, and also some uh, students that are doing a diploma or a master's or even the undergraduate on business and, and economics, and put them together according to their interests and their background to support these, comp these companies on, their, on the challenges that they are facing. Of course, we build some other services around to support these business units and teams, but also we have some relevant like um, content for the companies and on, on key on key matters that we found out through the interviews that they were interested in. You know, we have just to give you a quick example, one one on innovation, of course, we, we, we couldn't miss that one. <laughs> but we also have some on well-being where we bring the, the co-founder of Headspace discussing with the faculty. Also, we have another one on pivoting, how to pivot uh, your business idea, as you know, many of them are actually pivoting now. And mm -hmm. um, we have some of them on leadership. Uh, also, of course, on marketing. Marketing was a was a sort of big, big uh, need, and some of them on investment and how they can actually uh, take advantage of this situation to be able to fundraise because some of them were at the fundraising stage. So, how can you know we can definitely leverage uh, our network of experts? This is a great thing that we've done. So, we have a, a huge talent pool of faculty and students, but also experts and practitioners. So, we 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 thought let's bring those those communities together to support the, this com these businesses on the on their challenges and, and that's why we have like many different experts from different topics as well as the faculty and the students and and last but not least within just related to that we provide uh, these 35 companies that we've selected are providing 70 internship opportunities for our students and and they get some credits on top so that's really good for, for, for them in that sense. Super. So you would say um, students are open to collaborate for free and are, have this entrepreneurial spirit um, in their beings. Yes, definitely. And um, that's a very interesting question because when we were looking at designing the program, we just thought um, only those we, one of the assumptions that we had is, okay, only those interested in entrepreneurship will be willing to support. Uh, but then we found that that wasn't, that wasn't true. And actually, many others had other interests in different uh, areas, but no, they didn't necessarily want to become entrepreneurs one day. That's why we open up the scope. And we have some startups, but we have scale-ups as well as SMEs. Mm -hmm. that are involved in the program so that students can have an experience around, you know, pro product, product management, for instance, or a strategy and innovation. So they don't necessarily need to, need to have any sort of entrepreneurial background. And we, when we look at doing the matching between students, uh, we look at their preferences, but, but also we look at their backgrounds just to make sure that with the business unit, we have the, the relevant experience that is needed uh, from the company's uh, perspective.
Fantastic. And uh, which, which were the challenges that you, that you faced throughout this process of innovating in such a short term also? No? Because how long did the period take from the idea to the execution? Yes, uh, to be honest, I would need to look at the calendar, but I think between having the idea and launching it, it's been around a month and a half. Okay. So it's been a, a, it's been a sprint. We call it in sprint in innovation and a sprint in when running. And it's literally been, been like that. And I mean, the biggest challenge for me, on the one hand, I would say it's, it was the workload that we all had because we weren't like, oh, all of a sudden we don't have anything to do and then let's focus on doing something. It was like we have everything and then we add something else new that wasn't added before. So that I think uh, that was a, a big challenge, but also for me as a kind of facilitating the innovation methodology throughout the process, the biggest challenge was how to do everything remotely. So I, we were kind of learning by doing, we were using new tools like online tools, like Mural, Miro, uh, Trello, and, and you know, it, we, we were using them for the first time. So we were all learning at the same time as, as we were doing. And I would say that is a, a big challenge. And also always in innovation, you need to manage uncertainty at the beginning. That is, for me, the biggest difficulty. And I would say in our sense, I mean, it was good because we had support, but also because the team kind of embraced the idea from the beginning. And I think that was very important for us because we, will, we all felt this is our idea. This is our sort of opportunity to do something relevant. And we embraced that from the beginning. And that's very helpful on innovation because you always have, I mean, it's very easy at early stages when you know nothing about what you are going to do and what the future is going to look like. It's very easy to just uh, uh, criticize uh, everything. So, yeah. Okay. Super. Because yeah. it's, um, it's very interesting, the pyramid that you mentioned before. It would be great if you could guide us through it no? and through each of the, the, yes. the phases. Uh, especially because when I think of Oxford, which is a university which has been existing since since when has also been existing wow, I mean, centuries 900 years I, yeah I, I wasn't, <laughs> and so the, they, they weren't either yeah <laughs> <laughs> so it's 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 a very traditional institution and it's very interesting to see uh, your role especially you know as as the director of the entrepreneurship center it's um it, it, it could be contradictory you no know, tradition and innovation but uh, I think this pyramid may give us uh, the, the explanation on why Oxford still exists, basically. Yes, well, actually, I mean, um, you've made the, an amazing question. And, and actually, I have never been asked this question, but I have some thinking behind. And to be honest, I always say this just to cl my close friends when we are talking, but Oxford, for me, is the most innovative in the, in the university in the world from but this not now um i would say from its conception and i'll i'll give you the the reason why i think i think that because uh, other universities are organized um in 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 faculties they are like all, all grouped towards a theme yeah so you study economics and then you attend the economics uh, faculty with, you know, all your, your colleagues. And then you might have like another class next to you. They are doing a master in economics, different degree, but always within economics. Yeah. But actually the, the, the structure of the Oxford University is made up uh, by colleges. So students are affiliated to a specific college, but there are other colleges. There are different colleges teaching the same topic. So you can do history or humanities in the Christchurch College, um, or you can do the same degree in a different college. So it's funny because you have the colleges kind of competing against, uh, against them for the kind of same degrees. But at the same time, you can be uh, doing, let's say, humanities in a, in a college, and the, and the student in the next room to yours is actually studying medicine in the same college. So you spend a lot of time with that student from a complete different discipline to yours. So you interact with them, you gather, so you meet engineers, doctors, a complete uh, different kind of set of skills. 
a very diverse group of people. And I think that is hugely beneficial. And from an innovation perspective, you know, it's all about diversity and all about bringing different skills towards the same place. I think the way the university is structured, it's definitely helpful for that. Um, I mean, that's just a kind of more theoretical reflection around innovation, but I always think that this is the case. It makes sense, total, because it, they say diversity triggers innovation, no? Yes, and that's why I would say it's a bit of a chaos here in general, uh, but, but I think in a good way, in a good way. But then, of course, um, and then just coming back to your kind of first part of the question about the pyramid, I mean, yeah, the pyramid is just like uh, going from a broader, so at the bottom of the pyramid, you know, we have mindset and culture. So things that are, you can run an event and bring uh, motivational speakers, good practices so that people can learn what are the benefits about, you know, being an entrepreneur or, or, or about actually innovation, because we, we do a lot of things around, around innovation too. And then you move towards the top and then you have some programs or courses that uh, teach you some, some needs, some, some skill sets some competences that you need to have to succeed within you know the entrepreneurial world or becoming an entrepreneur because we also cover that that uh, with with another program and of course we also have another program which is curriculum that teaches you some methodologies and frameworks that you can use to analyze when you have an idea what sort of uh, stages you need to go through to move that idea forward then you kind of get uh, towards the top of the pyramid where you have kind of accelerators in terms of, okay, we take these ideas, business ideas already existing, and we try to accelerate them by providing, you know, some, some guidance and, 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 and advice. Uh, and then finally, you need funding. So we also, you know, run a seed fund uh, where we can, uh, where it's actually a student-led initiative where students decide where to invest but they gain a strong uh, knowledge around what is important when investing. So when you are in the other side of the entrepreneur, uh, but, but it's very helpful for them when they become also entrepreneurs because they understand from a different perspective what can be you know, uh, analyzed and looked at from a, from a different perspective. And then across the pyramid, you always have these networks uh, and experts that actually we, we, we leverage. We have a great network of experts in, in the center that we leverage uh, uh, for our programs and to give support and direct support to, to students. But I would say, so across all, the, for me, the most important thing, and for me and for many other investors and many other people, is actually the team. The most important thing for an entrepreneur to succeed is the team. And, and I think what we do from the entrepreneurship perspective, we always look at things in a way that, okay, we have a huge talent pool at, this, at the business school with MBAs and executive MBAs with business background, which is relevant for many of the ideas, but also we, with a strong appetite to become entrepreneurs. And definitely that, that sort of appetite is growing over time. So we see that on the one hand, but also we say, okay, how can we, because some of them have ideas already to work on, but some of them don't, but they want to be helpful. So it's about building bridges with the entrepreneurial ecosystem and community to bring those ideas. There are great tech-based or science-based ideas also within the, within the IP of the university. So how can we sort of build those bridges to bring those ideas to our students for our students to complement these entrepreneurial teams. I think that is a, our sort of key approach towards making more sustainable and more complementary and more a stronger, in, I mean, in, in the essence, a stronger entrepreneurial teams, because that's the key for success in entrepreneurship in the future. Fantastic. So um, I, would, I would like to, to go deeper in, in the team element, no? Uh, mm -hmm. what, if, if you could tell us what makes a good team. <laughs> so a good team for me, I mean, the idea is going to change maybe 90% of the times, yeah? But the team is not. So I think the team needs to be complementary. And, and that for me is, is the most important uh, feature of, of, of a team. It has to be complementary in terms of background and knowledge, yeah? but it also has to have the relevant knowledge that is needed for that particular idea to be moved forward. 
and and then I would say resiliency. I mean, in that sense, a resilient team. The team has to be, the attitude has to be resilient and has to be able to adapt to change. That for me is a, is a, is a key feature. And it has to do with adaptability also and flexibility. And also is related, I mean, there, there are so many different adjectives that we could use, but it's about getting feedback. So humble people, I mean, the humility is a big debate because you can say humility, is, is it going to help or not? Because sometimes you get a typical stubborn entrepreneur really fascinated with the idea and then he's very successful. So it's not a matter of humility in a way of, but, but, I, but I'm referring more uh, in a way of be intelligent to benefit from the feedback around you. Mm -hmm. That open sort of attitude towards feedback is for me key. Mm -hmm. because it's about willingness to learn from others and it's about just also being resilient and when you fail just learn from the failure and keep moving and moving uh, and, and move on mm -hmm. i would say those are i mean i said many different kind of uh, ideas but but i think definitely that's the so it's, it's about moving from the ego system to the ecosystem yes exactly yeah, <laughs> big egos. i always say big egos don't help for anything in life <laughs> uh, but but of course you can find many many examples against this this, <laughs> this uh, affirmation. So I'm not sure what is right or not, but it's about. <laughs> I mean, this is what I what I believe. <laughs> uh, and um, um, now you you're being in touch with many entrepreneurs and students who want to become entrepreneurs. And I was wondering what tendencies do you see uh, in terms of uh, are there more female entrepreneurs than we had before? Um, which which are the backgrounds of the of the entrepreneurs and what kind of ventures are they thinking of creating? Yeah, well, that's a that's a good question. Definitely, yes, there are more female entrepreneurs, and you know we are we, we there are there are. Uh, I would say, generally speaking, there is much more interest around entrepreneurship than before than for for instance a couple of years ago. Yeah, so it's definitely growing. In terms of female entrepreneurs, yes. Uh, there are more. We have actually some programs, you know, for, for, for them. And we have a faculty at Said, actually, a, a great faculty member, uh, Renee Adams, and she's done a lot of research around women and their representation on boards. And I, I found fascinating one of the findings that she was sharing with me about, because we all have the negative perception that female founders are um, less successful when fundraising, yeah, for the venture. And I'm, I'm not saying it's not true, but uh, she was telling me that actually those boards with a higher sort of female representation on them are more successful at innovation and at taking uh, more risks, more mm. sort of measured risks. So, so I think, you know, there are, there are great um, learnings that you can you can get from from that uh, affirmation, and you know uh, she gave a, a whole uh, sort of a talk ab around around this topic, which I found very interesting. So so, but yeah, there is a, still a lot of things uh, that we can do uh, about that. And in terms of the the ideas, what what I see that this current sort of COVID nineteen situation has created is like that. There's definitely a radical change in consumer behavior. So we are going to be back to basics in some way. Uh, human needs uh, are going to change and hopefully for the better and are going to be more fundamental and less superficial. And I think this crisis has showed what is sort of truly relevant and I expect some kind of social transformation the, that will remain and that we learn, learn from it from this. So hopefully for the better. And I think as a society, we are all sort of trying to understand how the new normal will look like. Uh, but I feel that we kind of agree that we will now go back to normal in the way it used to be. And all this transformation in society will bring a great deal of opportunities for entrepreneurs to focus on sort of a, a, across different, different sectors. Um, there is not a pattern that I've identified already because this is very recent. Uh, but I would say like digitalization will be a great thing 
as we, we've all experienced the benefits from it and there is a big scope for digital transformation across different sectors. Mm -hmm. I would say uh, we had the, the, the slow industries around innovation like health, government and education. Those are the three for me kind of more um, that, that needed to learn the most from, from innovation and what the benefits are. And I think, I mean, they've been less, less proactive uh, in the past. And I think the crisis uh, has helped uh, them to learn the importance of innovation. And hopefully these industries will transform by adopting new innovations. So I can see a lot of potential uh, here too. And well, I, I would say, I mean, for instance, in the past, like few months, we've had a kind of a, a lot of solutions from entrepreneurs related to aging uh, population and climate change because you know there are big issues for our society and the, all those solutions that are oriented to solve those problems are going to be hugely relevant uh, in, the, in the future and i mean i would say those are the sort of the biggest in a in a nutshell kind of the biggest sort of trends Super. Mm -hmm. So, so when when you mention uh, the aging populations and the um, and the and the climate change, um, social entrepreneurship comes to my mind. No, do you think mm -hmm. it may be like a point of inflection for social entre entrepreneurs? Yes, I mean, uh, ideally, yes, and that that brings another kind of a uh, big debate to my mind, which is like, I think there's a really fine line between let's call it general entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship. And I think with this crisis, that line is even finer uh -huh. because I think the purpose behind an entrepreneur has to be, um, of course, finding and developing a solution that is relevant, that, that is relevant, that, that actually tackles a, a relevant need. But a, around that, there are so many different uh, factors that, uh, that are taken into consideration, such as, for instance, like, well, the impact that you create, the, the job, uh, the employment that you generate, but of course, the positive impact that you have in society. And I think that's becoming even more and more relevant. So I would say is about entrepreneurs being more sort of acknowledge how important is their roles the individual roles, but as an sort of organization in, in kind of creating sort of a better world in the future. And, and yes, if it was, <laughs> I always think that there is a really fine line um, because it looks like, oh, social entrepreneurship is, is good and the rest of the entrepreneurship is bad in terms of, well, it depends, of course, if you are developing a bad solution. That, um, but we, we don't look at those sort of solutions here at Oxford, I have to say. So, so in that sense... I think the crisis is going to bring um, those two worlds hopefully more close together. If, if you could rec give some recommendations to entrepreneurs or social entrepreneurs uh, to get through this crisis, uh, what would you say? I suppose it would depend if in which stage they're in, no? Yes, uh, yeah, um, yeah that's, a, that's a sort of great question. Yes, definitely the stage. I, I think what I found uh, is that uh, early stage sort of entrepreneurs are more flexible to cope with this crisis just because it's a matter of overheads and, and smaller structures. And, you know, entrepreneurs, I mean, um, are always willing to uh, just don't get any, they don't get any income, you know, for, for, for a for a period of time. So it's something that they can kind of uh, can deal with it. Whereas SMEs with bigger structures are really, you know, uh, they have a shorter uh, runway. And just because, just because, you know, they are, they are, they need some cash and they, they need to survive. So, so I think the approach is kind of different, but I would say it is very important just to survive during the crisis, because if you do that, you will, uh, come out stronger after after the crisis and i think it is very important to take sort of this uh, to take the opportunity of rethinking the way you do business and your business model so that whatever you do is kind of relevant in the new normal that's a difficult thing to say because we don't know what the new how the new normal is going to look like but there are some things that you kind of you can sort of uh, suspect or, or, or detect. So I think it is about 
rethinking your 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 business uh, model, your activity for for the future, so that it's relevant in the future. I think that is a uh, key because if you stay kind of doing things in the same way, these big changes always. Um, I mean, you, you, you have the risk of disappearing. Super. Thank you so much, Maria, for your time and your wisdom. Well, very happy. I really enjoyed uh, talking to you, Anna. This is Proyecto Co, a channel of collaboration and co-creation for social good.